um, I forgot to get the, the notebooks uh, into the repository, so I'll get these all in there real quick. Um, so you guys can see them. So hopefully you guys will be in the content and um, um, we'll think about, you know, um, I wanted people to start looking at the Unit you know, 3 stuff and also looking at the, like, the Chapter 1 and 2 from our uh, textbook. So... to the class resource repository here. I haven't tried rerunning these, so I don't guarantee that they'll run cleanly until I get a chance to test them, but I'll at least get them out here. Should be available here in a moment. Um, the ones that I'm going to talk about today. Um, if uh, if you do a get poll here, you know, they should be up there now. So, um, okay. So let me get started proper here. So sorry, sorry for doing a bit late. Um, so my plan today is uh, I did more review a little bit for the first assignment. Um, I have a few things to say. I did, if you didn't see, um, I did give back uh, evaluations for Silo 1. So um, the way I'm giving most feedback um, is as a, a comment back on your GitHub classroom repository. Right? So that's where you should find uh, the more detailed kinds of things that I gave. Okay? So, um, So oh, I did pass like I did post like a example solution. Let me go ahead and uh, open this up here. Well, it's been too long on this, uh, but uh, so a few more general things I kind of want to uh, remind people of uh, here in the video um, about doing the assignments here. So. Let me open up the assignment one solution. This should be the one that I posted. Um, so, um, let me remind people again. I don't know if uh, uh, you know is, is anybody here that did this. Uh, I didn't mention this in class, but yeah, make sure that you are using the relative path name. Uh, um, starting with assignment two. Uh, it will become doubly important that the things uh, or that the A file you reference is uh, is done correctly so that it runs in the auto grader and stuff. So um, yeah, and uh, I, I meant to have assignment two up, but I'm still working on it. Um, uh, hopefully tomorrow, hopefully before our next class, I'll post assignment two uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So I, I basically just. In case uh, you want to know, uh, I've been reworking these, and I want to get them into using the, the, the GitHub Classroom 
and I wanted to set up some using the auto grid or using the, the GitHub actions and workflows to do stuff, right? So basically, uh, the next assignment is still not really where I want it, but I'm going to just get it up and posted tomorrow sometime. Uh, there will be some parts that will be uh, auto graded using GitHub, uh, including a check, hopefully, that your notebook runs cleanly, all the cells, and some other stuff that I mentioned here. Um, so uh, that will give you a little bit more feedback, so you'll be able to work on the assignment, push a commit, and see whether it's actually passing stuff or not, uh, and get kind of a, a, a grade uh, from the auto grader um, as you're doing stuff. So, uh, back, but back to this one. So. Um, Make certain that uh, you do use, uh, all files should be relative, so uh, I mentioned this, this is just the kind of the standard practice for really projects that these work, uh, machine learning and other contexts, so uh, you, know, you should never have absolute paths uh, built into things because those won't work whenever you move it to somewhere else unless you change the absolute path. So, um, um, whenever you're doing a file, the only thing we had to do for this assignment was the, the last one. Uh, but we do have to, you know, uh, expect that your notebooks are always running from a notebooks directory or some directory that you have to go back one up to get to the root of the project, right? So um, our, you know, our notebooks for assignments are always going to be in the notebook subdirectory, but to get anything else, including data, you have to go up one level uh, and then relative to that into the data. That's where all the data files will be. Right. And any other file would be the same kind of pattern, right? So if I need something in source, it would be one up in source. If I need uh, to save something in figures, a little figure would be one up in figure subdirectory and so on. Right? So, I mean, yeah, I still had, I had five or six people were hard carrying this or were trying to dynamically figure out what the directory was and dynamically construct the, 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 the path. And that's not going to work for the auto grader. Right? So, um, and in general, you know, do this. Again, I, you know, I had, again, I had at least four or five people, the notebooks didn't run cleanly, right? And that can lead you significant points, uh, starting with the next assignment. Uh, it could even get you a zero, uh, depending on where your notebook is failing or, or you know, that you have things. So, you know, again, for you guys or for anybody that watches this video after the fact, it's, it's really in your best interest. Either. I think it'll be a little bit easier for the society too because it will actually run the, try and run all the cells for you every time you do a commit. So you can check what I'm seeing, whether it looks like all the cells are running cleanly from top to bottom. But you really should check. You know, so the easiest thing to do is just use the restart kernel and run all cells. Um, a little I don't know, uh, thing on the... On the the quick bar here, or that, that's equivalent to the kernel, restart kernel, and run all cells. Okay? If you're not doing that, the, the most common thing is uh, people changing a variable name and not renaming. Or the other thing is, is people defining something uh, like in part four. Uh, and then going back and working on part one, um, not realizing that they, they define a variable, but they don't define it before the stuff where they actually use it. Right? So in that case, your notebooks won't run cleanly. So, so they are meant to run linearly or sequentially from top to bottom, usually. Read that way and run that way. So, and, and they should successfully run all the cells. So just check that. If, if, you, if you still don't know what I mean by that, you know, let me know before uh, you get started on assignment two. Um, some style things, I, I don't know if I'll ever take points off of this, although if I get too annoyed, I might tell you I'm not going to grade it to you uh, fix your, your Python style. Um, but uh, yeah, so there is like a Python standard, PEP8. Uh, that link's not working. <laughs> um, So I'm going to have to fix that link, but um, this isn't going to work, is it? I'll fix 
Thanks, Adeline. Sorry about that. I put uh, most of the wrong line. That was the one that I gave for the feedback, too. So anyway, um, I don't know. The general thing is uh, um, your indentation should be four spaces. Your indentation should be consistent, so don't have somewhere where it's two spaces in your work and then four spaces somewhere else. Um, um, operators, like binary operators, um, um, should have space around binary operators, so uh, you know, should have space around pluses and equals and stuff like that. And, uh, use use uh, the use the underscore naming for variables and other functions. Uh, use uppercase for um, uh, uh, well, you know, it says later. I mean, these are the different styles, but um, uh, basically. Um, Functions and variable names should use um, the lowercase uh, with the underscores uh, and, and so on. Yeah, we won't go into too much on that. But this is the standard style guide that most people use for Python projects. Um, um, and you know, I, I probably won't take points off of, of, of it, but I might get annoyed if it's if you're doing stuff that's uh, really not formatted well. So I might even add in the Python linter checker. Uh, if I can, to these assignments, uh, to have it automatically run that stuff when you uh, submit stuff. So. Um, so I'll fix that link. I don't know what's wrong with that, but uh, uh, you can just search for the Python Pep8 style guide. Uh, likewise, I mean, you know, this class isn't about, uh, oops, about, um, about using Git or DevOps or stuff like that, but uh, uh, I do like people to use kind of best practices for like commit messages. So I don't like seeing commit messages that were um, like uh, uh, made a commit, made a commit, made a commit. I can't tell what you're doing just from reading the commit messages. So um, you should have like a, a summary title and then a sentence or two description for the commit messages. So yeah, I don't know, neither of those are working. <laughs> I guess I gotta fix both of those. Fix those links. Sorry about that. I didn't realize those were bad. Um, okay, those were just general things. Just to kind of keep in mind for all future assignments. Uh, do uh, so. It'd be more important starting with the second assignment, but you know, you do need to keep in these calls to run the doc tests. So, uh, and also, you do need to, uh, you know one thing in the style guideline is you should be using the, the doc strings for functions. I gave them to you for this assignment, but should be in there, uh, including the doc test should be part of the doc. And I noticed um, I had a mistake on this. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if anybody caught it, uh, but yeah, I had a copy paste error on the efficient version where I was still calling the inefficient. I had one or two people that uh, obviously the code shouldn't be working, but it was working because I was trying, I didn't realize that until I was about halfway through coding. So, uh, but anyway, you know, yeah, if you're running these, um, you know, these are also meant to help you check. Uh, whether uh, uh, what you're doing is what is expected or not. Like for this one, if it's running the doc test, um, um, this little call at the end here, you shouldn't remove that. You should use that, uh, and you should use you know the the the, uh, the, the pydoc string um, with these doc tests in here. That will actually just run those, right? So you should get all okay with this. Our first item two, the same thing. You should get all okay if that runs in the right direction. If it doesn't. Uh, you might have an issue, you might not be implementing something the way I expect, you're not getting the, the correct answer or the correct result. Um, besides that, um, um, I mean, almost everybody, except for maybe one or two people, are pretty much where you need to be in terms of, I think, in terms of understanding stuff, implementing stuff, right? So. Um, uh, I had one or two people weren't actually using memorization. We, we got two, what, three or four or five points taken off of this. So, so some people were like having a, like a loop in here. Uh, so if I asked it to calculate the 37th, the loop went from like 3 to 37, uh, calculating 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th one. Um, and that's not really memorization. That's that's just the uh, pre-computing 
we just need to know to, 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 to compete with the one through the 37th one, right? So memorization of the I gave, I don't think I gave everybody this comment, but to me, the most, this is the cleanest kind of implementation. The, the idea of English is, is that you first check if it hasn't been memorized yet. So if it's not in the lookup table, we'll have to do the work to do the calculation and insert it in the lookup table. Once you've done that, so after that, I know it's in the lookup table, so I can just access the lookup table and do it. Right? So if it's already in the lookup table, just to skip over it, we access it later. If it's not in the lookup table, you do the work to calculate it, and so you look up. Right? So, some people did it the opposite way. So check if it was in the lookup table and return it, uh, so have multiple return statements, which yeah, works just fine, but um, uh, there's an alternative, alternative way to think about it. That's the way I need to think of memorization. Is, it, does it need to be does it need to be calculated? It's, it's not in the table yet. Um, and if, if it has been calculated, do the work to calculate it, get it into my table. And then after that, I can just do the work up from there on out. Um, all right. Um, so hopefully not anybody has been coming to class, but a few people. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nitpicky thing, but, uh, but um, the, the, I guess the point on this is be aware of the shape. So in some contexts, I need a, uh, a row array or a column array to make things work, right? So sometimes I need a vector one dimensional of five items, but sometimes I need a two-dimensional array with one row and five columns, or a two-dimensional array with one column and five rows to do the matrix multiplication correctly or whatever, right? So the shape will work or not, even though you have the same value, the shape will work or not work uh, in some contexts. Uh, and you have to have the right shape and the right number of dimensions to do different things. So just, uh, just a, a particular thing you need to be aware of for numpy arrays when you're using them, right? How many dimensions um, and what the number of items is in each dimension, their shape. Um, and, and, you know, like I talked about before, but, um, and I, I probably gave some, uh, some snarky comments. And to me, it's much easier to just figure out how to do Boolean, uh, Boolean indexing. We can write expressions that look almost like the algebra that we're trying to do here, right? So the update for Z, if you have a mask of just the values you want to update, is to take those values you want to update, so when I read this in English, the mask is the values uh, is, is the values that I want to do something with. And what I'm doing is those values I spread, uh, I add in uh, those corresponding values, the, the complex number, and we assign those updated values back in. Right? And that will only affect the ones where n is true, uh, if you do it like that. Um, I mean, not that you can't get it to work using other stuff, using NPWare and stuff like that, but, uh, but yeah, things like this, if you understand Boolean indexing or fantasy indexing can often make the readability more straightforward uh, when you do stuff like this, use vectorized operations and a vectorized arithmetic expression here. Um, all right, yeah, and yeah, most people, well, that's a common mistake here uh, for people that mostly got it right, is not really doing copy correctly, uh, or not doing copy at all. So, um, so I mentioned all before, if you don't do that, so the reason why I, I displayed z here uh, and then called the function and displayed z again is, is the, the z shouldn't be modified as a result of going in and calling this function here, right? So when I ran your notebook, I could tell, as long as you still have those in there, that uh, whether before and after was the same value or not, indicating whether or not you were correctly, whether you were operating on um, the parameter of the past end, possibly modified, or making a true copy of it and working on the copy. Some people made a copy, but then went off and did the work on the, the parameter that was passed in instead of the copy. For some reason, still not quite understanding why or what we're doing here. So. Um, all right, and uh, one or two people um, just hard coded this to be 256, or um, 
we're, we're ignoring the parameters. So I guess the general comment on that is it's just, you know, uh, understanding what the purpose of, of the function is and understanding what the purpose of the parameters are. So um, if you ignore the number of iterations, and this is 256, if I write another test that has to do 512 iterations, yours won't work, right? Uh, or if you have somebody that's, that's actually ignoring the C value and just punctured it in maybe 0.04 plus 0.6j. Right. But again, the purpose of that is I should be able to write small tests and use this function where we use a different um, um, constant complex number where we're updating C on and we get a different fractal if we do that. I mean, we really don't have that equivalent. Right. So, you know, that, that's what the purpose of these, these numbers are. Right. Hopefully everybody knows, you know, the basics. So that's kind of but the purpose of these first two weeks that uh, you go off and, and self-learn uh, the, the basics of Python, like writing functions. Right, so this is meant to be slightly more than a, a basic function, so we define a function. We have three parameters. We are using default values here, right? So if you don't specify, we don't have to specify C in the number of iterations. Uh, if you don't, it would use the defaults. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good question with your stuff you want to discuss. So. Um, yeah, and I think that's all that I wanted to mention. So, I mean, I'm almost everybody was fine on the pandas except maybe not loading the data file. So, um, pandas, NumPy, you know, we will be using them in this class, so you, you should continue practicing with them. Um, I'm sure you'll get examples and practice from doing stuff on how to use them effectively uh, to do stuff like this, you know. So pandas is, is really about um, um, uh, a, a table of numbers, um, and it makes it easy so we can do things like add new features or type of new features and rearrange stuff and rename things and also do data, you know, so uh, this week uh, you'll be doing in the next assignment you have to do it with data cleaning and stuff. So one of the big things of using the Pandas data frame is we can do cleaning so we can figure out if there's missing values easily um, uh, and, and fill in those missing values. We can uh, do things like normalize uh, features so they all have the same, have within a particular range and stuff like that. So that's some of the stuff that we talk about this week. Um, and that's one well, of the main things we use Pandas data frames for. Um, all right. So that, uh, if anybody has any questions, don't want to ask me books uh, in, in front of class, you know, let me know. If you, if you didn't understand my comments or anything, let me know. Yeah. Yeah, so let me know that we're, uh, since I've been having problems with Zoom, I'm kind of just recording the, I'll post the recording after the fact, so. Hopefully we're still recording here. Yeah. Check, yeah. Um, okay, so, let's move on then. So that's the first assignment. Um, there'll be a, f a few extra things in terms of the mechanics on the second assignment. I'll talk about that once I finally get it up and working. Um, um, all right, so for, yeah, for the rest of the day, let's move on to new stuff. Oops. What should I do? Um, so yeah, another announcement uh, at the beginning, I, I, I mentioned that there were, there were two notebooks, um, uh, I was planning on kind of just do, doing those today, uh, so look through this one on data acquisition and exploration. So these are um, um, uh, based on the, the readings from the hands-on machine learning uh, textbook. So. Um, Um, yeah, so um, the, the chapter two goes through uh, kind of an end-to-end -end example of getting a data set um, and uh, doing some cleaning stuff. 
So I, it, 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 it's, it's a little chapter. Uh, so before we dive into some detail, and get kind of a big picture of what a typical machine learning um, uh, project actually involves, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, I only just put these up there right now, so you should be able to do a get pull and, and pull down, um, hopefully I got all of the ones, uh, three different notebooks on exploration cleaning and uh, then doing some machine learning training. So, um, I think I might have missed one of those though, how did I miss that? should be the, the three notebooks that I really wanted to have here for you guys to start looking at. So, so the one on data exploration, these are all from chapter two, um, but um, our third week, our third year of the class. So, all right, let's see if, yeah, like I said, I am trying to be running these, so they might not run cleanly. Let's go ahead and um, let's start looking at those then. So, um, So, I'll go ahead and open up my class resources so I can do those notebooks. So yeah, I've got some things numbered incorrectly right now, but uh, let's go ahead and look at um, these. I don't know if I do all these today. Uh, let me really check if everything's running here in this notebook that I just committed and pushed to you guys. Yeah, it looks like it uh, stopped somewhere. So, uh, yeah, I, I got to fix some things, so uh, I'll change the relative path to that. So, yeah, if you're following along, I'll run along. Um, I'll fix these and push it back up there, but if you just pull it down, um, uh, some of the stuff might not be running yet. There we go.
So um, yeah, there's a couple of paths that uh, needed to be fixed, relative paths. So. All right. Um, so I was I was recommending. I mean, uh, yeah. So we should be going through chapter two. Uh, this in the machine in the end uh, example. Uh, this is a good um, kind of overview of the whole process. Um, and this will kind of say, you know, uh, after we do this, next week we'll get into uh, talking about uh, uh, actual um, uh, things like uh, classification and regression, uh, and then we'll start looking at particular machine learning models. So, so we'll get into linear and logistic regression as the first ones that we study in detail. Um, but um, um, So if you follow one of these, um, so yeah, let's just uh, go through these. Um, so the example from the chapter two was um, using a data set uh, and showing uh, some examples of what you might do if you're doing a real machine data analytics, more of like a data analytics project. So, so we've got a data set, uh, we want to get the data and do some visualization and uh, we first need to get it and clean it a bit, uh, do some ex exploration, um, and then uh, try and build uh, a model, uh, a predictive model uh, of some kind from the data. Right? So in this case, um, it's, a, um, it's a data set of, of housing um, uh, information, so it's, it's, it's information about house prices, uh, along with other stuff um, uh, with other uh, features uh, in California, if I remember right. Um, so I'm going to skip over this here. Let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's look at actually using it. So, um, um, so yeah, we, in, in this notebook that I gave you, it's actually downloading this. So I should probably just go ahead and move this in a pasture. I don't think it's that big. Uh, but let's take a look at what we have here. So um, if you look at this, uh, the, the, the function in the notebook that we gave, this code mostly comes from the uh, chapter 2. Right, so it's, it's really some of the same code that we see in chapter two if you uh, read that and, and use it from the hands-on machine learning. Um, but you know, what this does is this loads it and returns um, a pandas data frame. Um, we do this. So notice that we're basically uh, we're downloading stuff, but uh, the the uh, the end result here is we read in we get a, a common separate value file that we had for the first assignment, uh, and we read that into a pandas data frame. Right. So, um, so yeah, in this first notebook, uh, uh, in the first part of the chapter two, uh, it was talking a little bit about what you typically do when you're exploring data. So when you first started out with an unknown data set, how do you learn what's in it, uh, what's missing, what you might need to do with it, that kind of stuff. So. Some of the most basic, I mean, you know, you might have to do some stuff just to get it to load, right? So even if it's a comma separated value file, you might find that, um, you know, you have to set some parameters, there might be some things that are quoted in lines, stuff like that, you know. So it might not even load as, as simply as what we've shown here. But once you get it loaded, some of the, you know, the most basic question is how much data do I have and what kind of features and things do I have, right? So what we've talked about before, um, we mostly think of, in this class we'll be using just two-dimensional stuff, right? So we have, in this case, you know, if you look at the shape of that data frame that we got, um, it, it, I mean, this isn't big in today's terms, you know, there's 20,000 plus sample, there's 20,000 rows. Each row is a, is, a, is a different sample of a particular uh, set of information about housing data in some, um, it's like counties or something like that, some, some, some regions here uh, that we have. Right? So we've got 20,000 plus of those. We've got 10 columns. Um, so uh, what we've got is, so we just pulled out one of these at random. And we could have like, looked at the first five. So. Uh, So 
I just run everything above this point so I can uh, do some stuff with this. So another thing that you did on the first assignment, like um, was just um, um, call it housing here. Um, I pull out the first five uh, samples. I pull out one of them to look at. Um, here, the, 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 the feature names, the column names that we end up getting out of our data file uh, are pretty good here, so it gives us a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with. Right? So we've got a lot of this stuff. Um, we've got the location. Um, so it's, you might have to read to figure this out. So it's really not information about a single house. It's information about houses in some um, um, some political entity, like a county or something, I can't remember exactly. Uh, so that's why you know, we don't have the, the, the age of the house, we have the median age. So this is the, the median, not the mean, not the average age, but the median age is probably in years, most likely 52 years uh, for this house, for this set of data that was at that latitude and longitude. Um, this might, you know, if you, if you were thinking that this was a single house, this wouldn't make sense, but um, this is like a, like a total number of rooms, total number of bedrooms of all the houses in this um, particular area here. So, it's all on, right? So we've got other information. Uh, the, the, I guess that's the number of people. So this, this is a small one here. Uh, where we had, uh, if we look at some of these ranging from three or four hundred to, uh, we got two thousand. And um, so we could start asking some questions, like, you know, what, what is the range of, uh, what's the smallest and largest number of population size, smallest and largest number of, of, um, of these other things here, uh, the, the price and stuff. So, and, and this, this is uh, ultimately, to, to jump ahead here, what we want to do is build a model that we can use, we're, we're going to use this column um, in this, this chapter, uh, the median house value is going to be our label. So we're going to build a machine learning model that uses some of these features, or maybe all of them, um, so that if I have um, some other area that I've never seen before, I have all that information, I have to give a prediction what the median house price is likely to be, house value is likely to be uh, in that county. Okay. I just use county here. Well, so these are counties in California. Um, so, what did we do here? So, there's just more, some more examples of using Canvas data frames to, uh, so we're, we're indexing by, you know, uh, by an uh, 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 integer index here just to get out like the first five um, total rooms for the first five samples and so on. So uh, here's kind of a first step to actually build a machine learning model. So uh, usually we want to have the, uh, the target if we're doing supervised learning uh, is going to be, so you know, typically we're generically we'll refer to X as a two-dimensional array of the features. So some number of the rows and samples, and some number of colleges and the features that we're going to build our data with. Uh, and then we'll big X. Um, um, because it's a, a matrix, we will use little y, uh, which will just be like a vector of um, um, values. So this could be, if we're going to do classification, this could be uh, some sort of um, um, uh, like yes, no, like a binary label or something. In this case, we are going to be doing a regression, okay? So um, this is the first thing I know about this. Two main problems uh, that we look at for supervised learning are the direct problem versus classification problem. So all, all that means is that um, um, 
in this case, we can kind of think of the thing that we want to predict, the, uh, the mean housing values effectively uh, is, is a number that can range anywhere from zero to millions of dollars to the value bigger. So it, it, it's, it's fundamentally different from if we had something that we want to predict that was just a, a fixed number of categories. Um, like we, wanted, I mean, we, could always, we could always turn a regression problem into classification. So if we wanted to build a classifier that, that um, um, predicted whether uh, this was uh, an area with um, expensive houses or cheap houses, we could maybe have a, a, cut, a cut threshold. And we put everything where the median house price was less than 50000 as a cheap or a poor area or something like that. Everything bigger is a, is a um, um, uh, not so poor, right? Turn into a binary class. So. Um, but that's what we ended up with the labels, and that's what we're going to be using for our supervised learning. So, yeah, if you look at this, um, um, and the copy is kind of important here. But if we didn't do that again, it would be a really uh, this, this is Pandas data frame, so it's a little bit different than NumPy, but, um, but here we're, we're ensuring that what we get out ends up being a new, um, uh, you know, a, a copy of those values. So nothing that we do on this should affect our original data set, uh, that we, the, the, um, the housing data frame that we have here. So, uh, but uh, yeah, in this case here, um, It's really still one of those pan, it's one of those series. It's the thing that represents a single column or a single attribute in the pan. But um, but the other C, you know, NumPy, or a site that we're now um, kind of can handle pandas data frames in series, so then we don't really have to convert this explicitly into a, a NumPy array in order to use it. So we can probably just leave it as like a series like this. So. Um, So, for me, um, one, of, one of the first things I do, once I did a successful load, is I would use like, um, uh, like the info and the um, describe um, to get a little bit of uh, more information about uh, what's in there, right? So here, you know, we're going to over So it's hard to me when I look at this for the first time, and I'm definitely watching out for stuff, the, 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 the type, right? So basically, for pretty much everything to be a float value, right? So it, it thinks that everything can be represented well as, as a real value number, except for one thing, the last one here. Um, and for that, so usually things that are string-like, uh, they have a lot of strings, you kind of show up as object types. Like it did here. Uh, and that's because, yeah, this, it didn't, there was nothing you could do to figure out how to convert that to an integer or a float or something else. That's more specific, so it kind of moves up. So when you see that, most likely we're working with a categorical variable, or you might be working with something that's really numeric, but we've got some data that's badly formatted or something, so we couldn't figure out all, how to convert all of it, and we might give up and turn it back to an object. So yeah, that's a, so having something come out as an object when you first uh, uh, read into a data frame using pandas uh, can mean different things. Right? Could be string, could be categorical, or it could be that there's some data claim that needs to be done so I can get into something more useful, a numeric type or something like that. <coughs> um, but yeah, so for all these numeric ones, so, so I should mention that. So one of the first things, uh, I might want to get a feel for the distribution of the data there. I might, I might know what the typical value is of those and uh, how much of a range there are and those things. Some of these don't make sense, right? So latitude and longitude, um, um, and, you know, we can kind of, uh, that's just the location. So yeah, what does it mean? The mean, the, the mean is probably going to be the, the, the middle of, uh, latitude and middle longitude in California, since this is all the way from California. Uh, but this might make, give us some more interesting ideas for some of these others, like uh, the, um, um, uh, 
that we still have the house value here, even though we pulled that out to a separate um, uh, variable that we're going to be using later. Um, so here we can get some information about you know, the thing that we're trying to predict. Um, oh, and the counts are kind of important here. Well, uh, yeah. So one thing that we're going to move on to here is that um, we, uh, to do some data cleaning, we have to ask some questions about like if stuff's missing or not in our form, right? So we can kind of get a hint of, of whether stuff is missing if you look at the count. So for any numeric attribute, um, if it's not the, the, the 20,640 count, that means that some of the data that got read in wasn't able to be converted. So it was probably missing or maybe not formed. Right? So, so in this, this data set was really only for example, but pretty much everything except for one of them um, that we showed here um, had uh, all the data. Right? So there was a few missing in the total bedrooms. And I can tell that from the count to be a little bit lower than the total number of rows or total number of samples that we had in our data frame here. Um, but, but yeah, so you know, this might help us. So for example, um, we've got a, a median house price as low as just below 15,000 um, is the lowest that we have in here up to um, 500,000 um, is the maximum that we have in here. Um, with uh, an average, uh, so 50% 50 percentile would be the same as the average the mean, uh, on this here. So averaging around 170,000. So this data set's probably old, so I, I'd be surprised if that's the actual, if we, if we had 2024 data here, but higher than that, even over the whole state of California. Um, Income might look, so I'm, I'm uh, bringing up some of the points that were discussed in the chapter from the reading. So, so income might, you might scratch your head on this. Uh, so you know, here's another thing. It's, it's uh, kind of standard practice for data sets like this to have what's known as a data dictionary. So another file that just lists out all the columns or all the features and describes them, what they are. You know, information like this, but already given for you. So that's a useful thing to have. Um, so, but yeah, if, if all we have is the data file, you know, we'll be able to talk to figure out what the income is here. It doesn't mean that we've got income that range from like four to fifteen max here. It was some kind of, of calculated measure, if I remember the, the textbook description. So uh, this can kind of roughly be multiplied by 10 or something like that, or 10,000 to get uh, what the income is. Um, um, and other things, yeah. So we have, um, so this can be useful, but um, as we later on do here, um, we might, uh, might be more useful to visualize some of that stuff. So, um, all right. So, uh, as, as I already mentioned, the um, um, the only column that we had that didn't look like it was going to be numeric um, was that ocean proximity. So, you know, we might want to explore what we've got in there um, and think about what we can do with it. Um, so, uh, something that's categorical, uh, our first question we would ask is what are the categories that we have? Right? And, and so value counts is a good thing. Uh, other things you could do to get similar information. But this just goes in there, uh, find out all the unique strings that we have and the count of each one of them. So now we've got some pretty skewed kind of categorical stuff. So we've got um, uh, a lot that's less than an hour from the ocean. And we don't have very many um, counties on islands here. So very few um, in that. Another nice thing, so some of the data cleaning um, in this example uh, is still too nice from what you would actually see on real data sets. So typically what you would see for something like this, where people were allowed to enter in 
uh, in some string is you can see all kinds of different variations that mean effectively close to the ocean uh, or, or some variations that are misspellings, you might have near bays, no or near oceans, no space in them, all that kind of stuff, or underscores, right? So, so yeah, um, so that's a typical the thing you'll get a lot of times for categorical data that you might have to figure out what the actual categories are and um, um, combine some things, stuff like that. Um, so, um, but yeah, we can ask, since that wasn't numerical, we can ask, is anything missing for these value counts or not? So, since I know I've got 1,640, if I sum those up, so here we just sum those up, so it doesn't look like anything's missing, so we didn't have any of those blank uh, for the ocean proximity. By the way, you know, if you're thinking about things the way I am, like the, the first time that I ever did this, you know, it seems reasonable this this might be a very good feature to keep, right? If, if we're trying to predict house price, things that are uh, out close, close to the ocean or on the ocean, Probably more expensive houses. Or if, if you know the way that, that California or American house markets work. So, so yeah, I mean, this is probably a feature that we would want to have if we want to build a model of the median house prices uh, for these things. Um, okay. So, yeah, here, uh, you know, having these ranges, uh, like the min and the max and the, the median, doesn't always give you uh, a good feel for what the actual distribution is. Right? Because you might have things that are actually uh, more really distributed or clumped or stuff, right? So, so to actually begin exploring the data, uh, numerical stuff like this, one of my first things that I'm going to ask is, what does it look like? What does the actual distribution look like uh, that you have? Um, that's what we kind of did here. So we uh, did a histogram. Um, this is using one of those convenience methods like you have to do for assignment one. Uh, this is going to create a histogram of all of the numeric things that the country is numeric uh, that we're trying to have in the housing data frame. Okay. So the point of this is there, there's some things jump out on this if you do the readings. Um, so, you know, not everything is just uh, like a normal distribution with one typical value. So we got some things that seem to be bimodal. Although, uh, then, um, um, yeah, for latitude and longitude, you might scratch your head and wonder about that. But these are kind of an artifact of, in California, there's two population centers. There's the up north, a little bit further west in the San Francisco Bay, and then they're down in Los Angeles. So uh, these are the number of uh, items that have been at different longitudes and latitudes, and that's coming out from the, the two main population centers. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that you can see, right? But, but there's other stuff that, uh, you know, so you see like this here on the median age, and that's what, that's the thing that we want uh, to try and predict, right? So, um, so that might mean something to us. In fact, like the textbook discusses, when you see something like that, it doesn't look like, it looks like probably there's houses with median ages bigger than 50, but they were thresholding this. Anything bigger than 50, a moving age of 50, then this mark was 50. Right? So instead of getting a long tail of moving ages of 51, 60, 70, we had a bunch of them that, you know, so it's not really the, the actual moving age. That's 50 or, or older moving age in here. Um, same here, the house value. Right. This is especially, you know, if I wanted to have a level back model model um, um, to predict the house value, that what we seem to be thresholded here as well. You know, we didn't really uh, record, this data set didn't record meaning house values of 600,000, 700,000, anything bigger than that. Just got entered as 500,000. Um, but that's the data we've got here. Um, But yeah, the median age does look, besides the threshold here, does look, you know, it's not just a single peak. There's, there's maybe a couple of other little clumps in here of some relatively new communities and some things that were built 35 years ago. Um, there's another peak there. Yeah. 
So anyway, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think about when I'm looking at data like this, trying, trying to understand what these might mean. Right? You, you, you might not be right in your hypotheses or in your supposition when you look at stuff like that, but, but that's a good first start to try to understand your data is you know, start plotting stuff like this and trying to think about, you know, what does this mean? So for for the rest of these, you know, it looks like we've got kind of maybe long tail sorts of distributions. So uh, we've got a lot of typical values, and then bigger ones kind of trail off. And some of these things, so these these might not be normally distri distributed. Um, there, there's some skew on these probably, uh, which might affect certain things that we want to do with them. Um, Let's see, uh, these are all from the textbook, uh, so hopefully I hit all the median income looks funny because uh, of that threshold. Oh no, the, the median income, um, like I talked about, yeah, and, um, we have to figure out what a mean, median income of 2 means or 14, but it, it only ranges from like 1 to 15 there. Um, um, but yeah, we talked about the capital values. Uh, another one, so part of data cleaning is some machine learning models like, like linear and logistic regression do not work well if you have features that are of widely different scales. And that's, that's the case here. So some of these, like, like these range from 0 to 6,000, 0 to 40,000, uh, where we've got some other things we might use as features that only range from 20 to 40 or 0 to 50. Right, so, so, so this goes uh, an upper range up to 50, whereas we've got other things going to 500,000. Well, that's the thing we're going to predict, but um, other things going like 40,000, so on. Right? So anyway, uh, yeah, things with different ranges like that can cause problems for some types of machine learning uh, predictors that we want to build. We'll talk more about that. Um, but that means that one of the data clean that we might need to do, we might need to scale these so that they all have the same, basically the same kind of range of values. Right? So we might want to map all of these into something that ranges from 0 to 1 to make those machine learning um, classifiers or regressors work better. Um, So, continuing on, just some more kind of fun stuff. Uh, I mean, this, this latitude and longitude, uh, in general, this data set does have a physical kind of location, so whenever you have that, uh, it might be a good idea to visualize it on an actual map that we're working with. All right, so just using latitude and longitude, you, you can you, know, you can see that this is really California, um, uh, if you know the shape of California. Um, but uh, this is, I mean, this class isn't about data visualization or graphing and stuff, but there's a little bit of that in this chapter. It's a good skill to learn. We could have a whole course on that if you're interested in data analytics, machine learning. So, you know, uh, to really understand the data, you know, we can maybe do different things to visualize it. Like, so here we're using uh, some features that are available in plots. Um, um, to um, um, add some alpha. So the, 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 all, all this happened here is we might not be able to tell kind of the density of things here very well. Because everything that overlaps, um, just overlaps. You can't see if there's one point or a thousand points where my cursor is here. So by adding a little bit of alpha, we'll get a better idea of how dense the data is in the different places here. More of a visualization trick. But this is the two population centers I was talking about. So we've got the in San Francisco, the Bay Area, we've got the Los Angeles metropolitan area here. And actually, I guess, uh, this is the, uh, what, that's the, um, uh, the, the, the farming uh, area. It's a lot of agricultural stuff happens in there, if I remember right. Um, so that's kind of what you're seeing. Again, what's it called? The Valley? The Bay of California? Um, So 
So again, this is all following the text, but yeah, so you know, we can get even uh, better. So if we want more information, so we might want information, uh, and we can use various plotting things. If you, if you look through my uh, notebook on plotting, uh, you saw a lot of examples of this kind of stuff as well. So uh, we might, we've, we've only got two dimensions, so we have to use other attributes when visualizing stuff like this to, if we want to add in extra information. So in this case, we're adding in population size uh, and house value, uh, so, and we're keeping that alpha so we can also see density. So here we use color so, so we can see that the hotter is going to be the higher uh, median house values and the bluer is the, the lower, uh, the, the less price house values. Use our color bar here, but, and then if you know California, as you would expect, you know all the, the the expensive houses are in the particular areas in the San Francisco Bay and the Los Angeles area, uh, where things other places, including this valley, in the agricultural area, have things at the lower end of the median house value stuff. So. Um, So, oh, uh, yeah, if, if, if you want to read this, uh, yeah, we're using still X for the longitude and Y for the latitude um, and some alpha here so we can see approximately density of stuff that's plotted here, but we're using uh, size, so the population divided by 100 uh, gets uh, translated into the size of the circle that gets plotted in the scatter plot here. So that's what the S attribute means. Um, and um, the color, C means color, um, so, so the, the color uh, I already talked about, um, um, we use the um, median house value. Um, but notice, again, we're just using um, those convenience plots, but you can do a lot with those convenience plots to quickly visualize stuff, uh, the convenience plots from Pandas data frame. So this is just calling the, the convenience plot on the housing data frame, but we're doing a lot with it. So we got a lot more feel for what we've got in here. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we get in here? Uh, Yeah, this is directly from the textbook. So if I were, if I wanted to, to get this figure, but for actually presenting, I don't know, at like a conference or presenting to my boss, working on this day in my life, probably I might want to make it look better, so I might want to add in some little more axes and uh, use meaningful things for uh, a color bar and, and actually use a, uh, a map so you can see the real um, California and the real political boundaries of counties and stuff in there. But yeah, this, again, this, this came directly from the textbook. Um, I think all this code is uh, from the chapter two of our textbook. Um, all right, so I think I asked you to do a little bit of this on assignment two. Assignment two does have a little bit of some data cleaning and visualization stuff to do. So all this I will use in the next assignment. Um, so one good question you can ask um, about uh, about the stuff that we have to build a model with is how good how good are the features going to be uh, for building a model that can predict the housing price? So uh, a useful bit of information is how correlated are the features to one another, or actually in this case, how correlated are the features to the thing we want to predict? Right. So if you don't know what correlation is. You might want to use the review materials and the statistics and stuff that I have, but it's, it's, you can think of it as just a number of how similar, how close, how, how well this particular feature predicts or changes with this other feature. Um, that's, that's what correlation is basically doing here. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, this is useful information. This tells us that maybe the median income, uh, total earnings, and median age might be good predictors. Those might be better features than the others since they're more highly correlated uh, with the thing we're trying to predict. And they don't ignore negative correlation, so things with high negative correlation are still good predictors as well. It's just they, they predict in the opposite way. So what this is saying is that uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But what this might be saying is uh, 
latitude is negatively correlated. So um, if you go back to the map, we look at the housing price. So the latitude is the north-south. So basically, most of the, the higher price stuff is down south here. Or, you know, so there's more higher price stuff in the south than there is in the north, latitude-wise. Um, so the, the, the bigger the latitude, the smaller the price is why it's negatively correlated in general. But, but again, yeah, I mean, if I had something that was negative 0.6, it, it, that, that's still a high correlation. It's just, just in the opposite direction. But that might end up being a good predictor as well. Things that are zero don't seem to have a lot of correlation. They might not be good features to help me make predictions. Um, so, so, yeah, things like the total bedrooms or the population are hovering around zero here. Um, but um, another thing, though, I mean, how the features are correlated to what we want to predict is one thing, but also if features are correlated with one another, if, if features are strongly correlated with one another, it might not be useful to have both of those features to build a model. Because uh, you know, if you have one, you don't really need the other. Right? So, and, and, for performance reasons or other reasons, sometimes you want to drop features that aren't useful. It'll make it so you can build your models faster. Uh, it might actually make your predictions better if you don't have redundant or, or overlapping information. So, so yeah, I think in the assignment two, I ask you to also do some cross and correlation matrices. So this is doing the same correlation, but between every attribute and every other attribute. So we end up with a table um, on our what, 10 or so numeric features correlated with the other 10. So you're going to have a perfect correlation, of course, of each feature with itself, but we can look through here and see which features are highly correlated with which others. Um, so like population total bedrooms, for example. That's pretty high, 0.87. Which, uh, does that make sense? So uh, in, in areas that have big populations must have Possibly larger families, so you need more bedrooms. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so, another thing, um, so here we're just doing, uh, using um, um, uh, the uh, this convenience function. So this is giving scatter plots between, we didn't show all of them. Uh, you could do all of them, but things would be really small if you can see them. So yeah, we picked out, I think, some of the ones with the highest correlation. So, but here, in general, if you don't, if you don't have scatter plots work, um, you know, if you have a, a general blob, there's not a lot of correlation. But if you have things uh, that, that are more kind of like a line together, there might be um, some correlation there. So I can talk about it. I'm kind of out of time. but. Um, but just another way of doing a similar thing, but using um, a plot rather than this, this one measure of correlation um, to, to kind of visualize whether you think two values are correlated or not. Um, yeah, that was one particular one. So, um, yeah, but. Roughly, a measure like this, like using Pearson correlation, uh, is going to translate to something that roughly, if you plot it, would look kind of linear. Um, uh, but you get a good line on it. Um, okay. So the last one, we're, we're, we're getting set up on, and I'll put this up then um, on Thursday. Um, so, you know, now that we have a little bit of a feel for the data, we're going to have to start doing some cleaning, um, maybe picking out which attributes we want to use. Another thing of building models is sometimes what we have, uh, you might be able to improve it. So you might be able to do some feature engineering by maybe taking some existing features or attributes and combine them in, in ways to make them better as predictors for the model that we try to build. So, um, so that's, the, the textbook discusses a little bit about that. does some combinations on some of these, um, and that's what we started doing here at the end here. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, 
uh, that's a good place to stop. We have to do that first one. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no good job up there. Uh, well, I guess nobody had access to them yet before the class, but put it down, read that chapter, do them yourself. We'll be doing the stuff that we assign it to. You, so. All right, well, I'll take it to see you guys in the next meeting, hopefully.